this is Yester's Eve, the magazine show that proves the past is a location best visited wearing a hazmat suit. We take an old gaming magazine and find out if their favourite and least favourite games are still worth playing today. And see if there's anything the issue can teach us about gaming when flog just meant you misheard the lyrics to a Madonna song. Our magazine today is a little weird. It's free handheld magazine Go, issue 9. Go was free because it was a supplement inside CVG magazine in this case, issue 128, but it still had an identity of its own. Go was set up because of the late 80s rise of handhelds like the Nintendo Game Boy, and with that very much being an endangered form factor in 2020, we'll be looking at how it all begun for handheld gaming later. But first, both the highest and lowest games from issue 9 were on that original Game Boy, and we're going to start with one that's new to me, but is related to one of my favourite games of all time. Outrageous new game, Tetris. And for head-to-head -head competition, use video link and blow your opponent away. Game Boy, only from Nintendo. You might be thinking this looks a lot like a SNES game. And you're right, it is. This is Tiny Toons Buster Bust Loose, a SNES game I love so much I have both a European and an American box copy of it. I do not own an American Super Nintendo system. It may well come up in an episode at some point, but as a value Jesterzine early adopter, let me assure you it's what we call in the trade, chuffing great. It's got good levels, plenty of serious characters, and some inventive boss fights like this one against a very hungry Dizzy Devil. Also, the wheel o comedy. There was a Mega Drive platformer too, Buster's Hidden Treasure, which was much more of a straight platformer, but which I also enjoyed quite a lot as a child. So there's a decent pedigree to this month's gaming heaven, Tiny Toons Bab's Big Break on the Game Boy. At first glance, this has a lot in common with Buster Bust Loose, most confusingly that you play as Buster. The story is one of Babs looking for her big break as an actor, but apparently she's not the one willing to put the work in, instead roping in Buster Bunny, no relation, to do all the heavy lifting. More than that actually, this game has three playable characters you can switch between at will. They're not wildly varied experiences though, differing only in what happens with their weapons. Hey look, Dizzy's hungry again! Entering the game, it's got more in common with the Mega Drive game than the SNES. It's slower paced, and if its graphical style reminds me of anything, it's Super Mario Land 2, which is obviously a huge compliment to it. Also notice I have to open these item boxes from the top, which I'm sure is the difference that kept Nintendo's notoriously jumpy lawyers away from it. Maybe a certain other game should have given that a try. So at the point I captured this footage, I, of course, had not read the manual and didn't actually know you could switch between the characters which gave the impression that Buster's carrots were useless. In fact, their arc is designed to take out airborne targets. If I want to get the ground enemies, what I want is Hampton and his watermelons. The temptation would be to tediously switch between the characters at will, but the lack of ammo guards against that, as well as the fact that you can of course get rid of enemies the traditional way. It's a pleasant enough experience through level 1, ending with Dizzy clearing us a way through to the boss battle swiped straight from Buster Bus Loose, where you have to feed Dizzy before he murders everything. He's never himself until he's had a Snickers. World 2 of the slightly stingy 4 in the actual game casts Furball as your helper, and starts with a trip through the sewers, like any good city break. This did bring up one of the other issues with the game, as I got lost twice, most notably in this confusing pipe maze. I didn't think I'd have to resort to my old Spectrum era trick of making a map as I played on a Game Boy platform game, but I'm starting to think it would have been a good idea. Still, exploring the level does bring up some of the variety, including quite involved things you'd only find by searching, like this lovely little race mode hidden in a pipe in the sewers. I do wonder if this game might be too difficult for the demographic it was aimed at, but it's certainly going to be hanging around on my flash car for my next flight somewhere but possibly after downloading a map. I'm guessing by now you've probably very much played the more famous Game Boy platformers, and if so, you should hunt this down too. Unless you haven't played Buster Bust Loose, in which case get the hell on with that man! In 2020, 
Handheld gaming is both stronger than ever and virtually dead. The final traditional style handheld holdout is the Nintendo Switch. But as much as anything, that's a home system with home system type games that happens to be able to travel. It's a lovely machine, and these days if you want new big budget games on the move, it's your only choice. Equally, gaming with handheld devices as a whole is a bigger industry than ever, dominated by the tablet and phone experiences that tend towards the dreaded word freemium, where games are free to initially download, but make progress somewhere between difficult and impossible without constant application of consumable real money purchased resources. And it works. Super Mario Run was a paid mobile download launched three years ago. But still, it hasn't made the money that Super Mario Kart Tour has done as a free-to-play title in its first three months as of these figures. And both are utterly dwarfed by the also three-year-old Fire Emblem Heroes, a free-to-play role-playing game that has made nearly ten times as much as Super Mario Run over the same time period. Whatever your views on freemium gaming, it certainly doesn't lend itself to the same gaming experiences you used to get on the move in the Golden Age, and anything made on the Switch generally has to take into account you could also be playing it on the TV instead. So dedicated handheld-only console formats are effectively dead as of 2020, as the 3DS slips out of mainstream support, and the other last-gen effort, the lovely Sony PlayStation Vita, never really quite found its footing. Equally, as you might expect, handheld game systems came along after their console brothers, making the handheld console era a surprisingly narrow time in gaming as a whole. The first video game system to take interchangeable cartridges that everyone remembers is the Atari VCS, later known as the Atari 2600, launched in 1977. In Europe, you'd be correct, but elsewhere it was beaten by year by the Fairchild Video Entertainment System, hastily renamed after the Atari launch to the Fairchild Channel F. Its lifetime sales of 250,000 are dwarfed by the 30 million Ataris out there, so you've probably never seen one. Well, I found the answer. Zelda Link's Awakening from Nintendo. You play a medieval elf named Link. Equally, your first guess for handheld with cartridges would possibly be the original Nintendo Game Boy from 1989. But it was merely the first to nail the format after some high-profile failures. Zelda, inexhaustible Nintendo. As early as 1979, British board game heroes and creator of the Vectrex, Milton Bradley, or MB to us cool kids, launched this, the Microvision. The machine itself did not have a CPU, and relied on the cartridge to provide this, which was confusing as there ended up being a mismatch between cartridges and machines. Early carts used an Intel CPU, which was so power-hungry that the Microvision demanded two 9-volt batteries to function at all, making it marginally more expensive to run than Gibraltar. Later on, supply problems and lower power consumption saw MB switch to a Texas Instruments chip that only required a single 9-volt. They changed Microvision hardware to only accept one battery, thus breaking compatibility with old carts. Although, thanks to it being too expensive to change the moulds, some quick-thinking genius at MB relabeled the now empty space as Spare Battery Holder. The cartridges took over most of the front of the device, providing a screen and control overlay specific to the game, covering up what was a plastic sheet with 12 pressure points underneath to be just the controls the games needed. MB Vectrex owners will recognise the concept of an overlay being used to cover up a machine's limitations, and limited the microvision certainly was with a processor running at 100 kilohertz. Yes, kilohertz. 0.1 megahertz, a 10,000th of a gigahertz, and 16 whole bytes of RAM tied to a screen with a resolution of 16 by 16. The classic era Sinclair ZX Spectrum, which is only three years newer, has 4,000 times the memory of this thing. Worse, the machine was horribly fragile. The control panel plastic tended to ripping, and poor ceiling means there are very few left today with working screens. Still, the Microvision was a moderate success, earning a profit for MB and its inventor Jay Smith, also inventor of the Vectrex. Nonetheless, it had a huge impact on gaming. One of them made its way to Satoru Okada at Nintendo R&D 1, 
That section was struggling a bit after a few commercial failures and had had a lot of engineers escape to other companies and departments. Two important people had stayed though, Satoru himself and his now considerably more famous boss, Gunpai Yokoi. Satoru got addicted to the Microvision's packing game, a breakout clone called Blockbuster. This is that game. And I can understand the appeal. You have to remember it's 1980 at this point, and this is a handheld system, albeit one that requires a small power plant worth of Duracell's finest. This thing runs quick, although the painfully low resolution makes it bloody difficult to play, although I suspect the original machine's dial might actually be easier than the mouse I'm using. Side note though, this is why emulation is fantastic. We've already discussed how fragile the machine is, and the few remaining ones are under a hell of a lot of tender love and care to keep them moving. Most of us will never get to play one, but here, this is the next best thing, and the stonking work done by Paul Robson to source the games and write this should be commended. Paul took it one step further, and using an Arduino actually built a new microvision, and here he is running Blockbuster on it. I doubt MB are going to pursue him, or Raf Coaster, who did some nice UI work for this, so I'll link Raf's site with the emulator in games and Paul's site with all his work in the description. You should give them a look. At the very least, download the package from Raf's site just to say you played this. The problem Satoru had with the Microvision was how big the thing is. You might have noticed that so far, but here's popular YouTubist Octavius trying to change the cartridge on one cartridges. This is what the cartridges look like by the way and they clip onto the unit like like, uh, like this. This present Satoru mentioned in an interview that he didn't understand why the thing had to be so big. When they tried to make one of their own he probably found out. Nintendo tried to make a similar pocket sized device but the technology in this pre nes period just wasn't up to it. We called Satoru to ask more and after comments such as who are you? Why are you ringing me? And it's 11am here, I've got time to talk. He offered the following. We first tried to make a portable console that people could really carry in their pockets, except that the screen resolution was very poor and the graphics were very abstract. Besides, we also thought that the idea of interchangeable cartridges was interesting, but because of Microvision's limitations, all the cartridges looked the same, both with their graphics and the concept of the games. So we said to ourselves, why not just have one game per machine but with good graphics at least. The result was this, the famous Game & Watch, a series of more hardy, high resolution single game handhelds first launched in 1980, when the Microvision was still, technically, a thing. But how did they do it? Well, this is where the oft-repeated origin story of the Game & Watch comes in. It's true, it just happened a lot later than generally stated. Yokoi-san was commuting into work one day, on a train, and spotted a man playing with his calculator out of sheer boredom. Suddenly, the idea of how to do a portable game with 1980s tech was clear. Use LCDs, where all the images were pre-baked into the display and could just be switched on and off. Doing this allowed some surprisingly pretty games, albeit with fairly limited gameplay. The Game & Watch series evolved from lovely single screen devices like this, which instantly made everything else in a handheld for the next decade look absurd, right up to these double screen devices which might put you in mind of a later Nintendo creation. There was another plus, LCDs are low draw, so rather than a pair of 9 volts, the Games & Watch only took a single button battery, but could still fulfil Yukoi's design requirement of a 6 hour battery life, enough to do Tokyo to Shinsankan and back on the train. We'll hear from Akada and Yokoi again soon, because they're very much not finished with changing the portable gaming world. But first, it's important to look at what the next 8 years brought in terms of portable gaming systems. You see, the Microvision is basically the most successful non-Nintendo one before Sega and Atari got involved, in that they managed to release 12 games for it and don't appear to have taken a massive financial bath on the whole project. That's going to be pretty unique. Entex tried the same thing with the Selector game. It too had cartridges which were essentially the whole system. Its innovation was that it seems to have been the first to do colour. If you can call a choice of red or very nearly blue colour, and if you are prepared to put up with an effective screen resolution of 16 by just 7. 
The Entex only got about 6 games, and the machine is marginally rarer than an on-time yodel delivery. So I haven't got hold of one, and no one seems to have been daft enough to emulate the thing. So if this footage intrigues you, can I point you back over at Octavius? They got hold of one in a daring midnight raid along with the Basketball and Space Invader games, and I'll link their definitive look in the description. The name 3D Gamemate certainly sounds like an attempt not to get sued by Nintendo, but it actually beat it by years. More to the point, it was by these folks. With MobyGo from VTech, fun and learning are just a touch away. With just a touch, your child can learn well done. math, letters, problem solving, and so much more. Add a pop-out keyboard. Touch, play, and learn with all your child's favorite characters. Plus, more learning games you can download online. There's learning fun in every touch with MobyGo from VTech. Who are, of course, still around trying to hawk ancient hardware to kids too stupid to buy an Amazon Kindle. It's like joke they may be in video game circles these days, but Video Technology Limited, now known as VTech, have been there since the start, releasing their first Pong playing console as far back as 1977. They even made PCs at one stage. Those, while not super successful, certainly did better than the 3D Game 8. Twelve years ahead of the Virtual Boy, whose concept it largely matches, there were only three games for the 3D Game 8, which makes the six made for its sister system, the optimistically named VTech Variety, almost successful in comparison. We're in 1983 by this point, and it's not getting much better. The Palmtex Portable Video Game System, also known as the Home Computer Software Supermicro, is a disaster, as long as its various brandings. Palmtex were a VTech importer, so you'd think that would have taught them, but come the end of 1982 they threw their ore in, just as the US console market went to crap. Unfortunately that wasn't the machine's only issue. The screen was basically only visible if you lived in the middle of an active volcano, and this was very obvious when they first showed it to the public. A hasty rebrand followed, from video game system to Super Micro, in the hope of fooling people who didn't buy consoles anymore, and the bundling of a light box, which upped the batteries required to 6 and utterly failed to save it. They ran out of money, with well less than 30,000 sold and 3 games made. This is also super rare, as the units are also very fragile. If anything, the Bandai Digicass is even more of a regression, going back to making every cartridge have to bring its own screen to the party. The games were basically no different to standard LCD ones, and only seven of those were ever made. Bandai, of course, weren't done with video games, at least. Astonishingly, there's still three abject failures left to cover. Epoch's Game Pocket Computer at least looks like something resembling a handheld system, and is probably the best known of this list. But even so, it never got more than seven games released for it, and two of those were pack-ins. And one of those was a paint program, which I'm sure was endless fun on a 75x64 screen. It was never released internationally, so it'll cost you at least two of your better limbs to get one these days. I wouldn't bother. The best thing I know about it is, it came with a cartridge for the two pack-in games. You don't need to use it. The games are on the system itself, and the only thing on the cart is instructions. It's basically just so you don't have to leave an exposed cartridge slot. One of Epoch's consoles though did get a release outside Japan. We just wished it didn't. If you don't know what this is, then we'll get to it one day. But yes, that really does say Barcode Battler. And yes, of course I own one. Boxed. This brand name you'll recognise though, if not the machine itself. This is the Etch-a-Sketch Animator. If it had been the size of a real lecture sketch we might have got somewhere, but it had a tiny screen. The draw was that it could store an underwhelming 12 frames for later playback, making the world's least convincing flipbook. Amazingly, there were three more attempts to do something like this by Etcher Sketch. None of them sold many, and they were all fantastically overpriced for something to do the job of a tiny notebook. Why they kept trying is just one of the unexplained mysteries of the world. Finally, we seem to have come full circle, because this is the IM26, which both looks like and works like the Microvision that was eight years older. This is what handheld gaming was like in Soviet Russia. 
They made five games, and information on any of this is almost non-existent, and for that we should possibly be grateful. So handheld gaming had comprehensively not taken off despite many tries, and you can see why. Because other than Nintendo's own very attractive, but simplistic and single game, LCD Games & Watch, the well-meaning crap we've just seen were the only handheld consoles. Really, since the Game Pocket Computer in 1984, no one had attempted a new pure gaming cartridge-based handheld. So technically, the Epoch Game Pocket Computer was still state-of-the-art. And then, in April 1989, Satoru Okada and Gunpai Yokoi released their new challenger. There were four launch games, but I think this is the one you'll recognise. The leap from those other handhelds to the beautifully animated monochrome glory of Super Mario Land was an astonishing one. The Game Boy was easy to hold. It ran for a double-figure number of hours on a vaguely sensible number and type of battery. It had a screen you could see most of the time, and barely cost more than those other systems. The other three launch games were Breakout Clone Alleyway, a conversion of the NES's baseball game, and the inevitable Mahjong title Yakuman. Those were all developed by Intelligent Systems, who in a very neat callback were also responsible for all 600 million grossing dollars of Fire Emblem. I don't think I need to tell you though that good though Super Mario Land is, and it's still very good, the reason everyone owned a Game Boy came just two months later. By the time we in the UK got the Game Boy in September 1990, our launch lineup was Alleyway, Baseball, Super Mario Land, and Tetris, with a whole year worth of the best of the Japanese titles following them through the door. It was huge. By the time the updated colour version was released nine years later, Nintendo had sold 64 million of the things, and by the time the last original Game Boy Colour was produced in 2003, that number was nearly 120 million. It still sits third in the list of all-time bestsellers behind the PS2 and Nintendo DS. Handheld gaming was born. I've done the maths for you. The combined number of games released for all the systems I mentioned between 1981 and the launch of the Nintendo Game Boy in 1989 is 57. There were 1,055 commercial games released for the original Game Boy alone. It wasn't just a successful system, it created the form factor as a viable commercial entity. Which is interesting, because that was not supposed to be its form factor. I mentioned Yokoi was Okada's boss. That accounts for why, thanks to the vagaries of how the Japanese go about things, that Gunpai is considered the inventor of the Game Boy. The device, however, owes a lot more to Satoru. Yokoi wanted something much more like a 1989 brand Microvision, basically delivering what they couldn't do back in 1980. The games would be simple, and there wouldn't be any third-party publishing. Okada disagreed. He had ambition. He was looking for something much more like a handheld Famicom, the Japanese name for the NES if you somehow don't know. He wanted full-size games, he wanted a proper screen, and he wanted it to be as open to hundreds of games as that machine had proved to be in the half-decade since his Japanese launch. There were arguments, quite a rare thing in a Japanese business. But ultimately, Okada won, Yokoi giving him full creative authority to, essentially, put up or shut up. He put up. Here's a fact you may not know. It wasn't the Game Boy everywhere. In South Korea, it was given the world's laziest makeover and called the Mini Comboy, where it's distributed by 
of all companies, Hyundai. The original group, Nintendo R&D One, stayed together through the release of some of the updated Game Boys, such as the Pocket and Light. But in 1995, they released the now legendary Virtual Boy. There's an entire feature there, but in short, it had its proper motion functionality stripped out late thanks to being jumpy about Japanese laws, and was a commercial and critical disaster. Gunpai Yokoi left Nintendo shortly after, although he always claimed it was unrelated. He formed his own company and created the Wonderswan handheld for Bandai, before unfortunately being killed in a traffic accident just a year later. R&D 1 split in two. The software side continued until Metroid Zero Mission in 2004, but Satoru Okada followed the hardware guys to Nintendo Research and Engineering, aka Nintendo Red, and continued to work on every dedicated Nintendo handheld right up to the 3DS. At this point, the department was merged with the main console hardware team, with the Nintendo Switch being the almost obvious result if you think about it. Satoru, though, sensibly chose that as his time to retire. And retire this feature we must also, because there's a gaming hell to be dealing with. Firstly, though, a huge hat tip to Retro Gamer magazine, whose interview with Okada in issue 163 was used for much of this research. There's more in that article, too including how the DS got its D. But you can read that later, because we need to play this. Centipede was a 1981 arcade machine from Atari and Ed Logg, creator of stealing most of Gauntlet from someone else, as I found out some time after putting it exactly the other way round in episode 5. If I find a game somewhere previously called Lots of Legs on a Tube, then I won't be surprised at all. That said, he had a co-creator. Donna Bailey, who is mostly forgotten in video game circles, as this was her only real finished game. Not a bad legacy. Donna had only got into video games at all when she heard the song Space Invader by The Pretenders, and later found out that not only was it a video game, but it used the same processor she was already working with writing software for cruise control systems at GM. And Centipede is basically a development of the Space Invaders idea, adding some vertical movement and playfield obstacles to the mix. So let's look at the Game Boy one. Hey, it's our old friends Accolade, stars of the early episodes of fine documentary series The Biggest Game Developer You've Never Heard Of. The intro is all very upbeat and nice, and so is this music. Although get used to it, because it's about all the game has in that department. As we'll see when we start a game. Yes, it really is this simple. But what do you expect? This is a first generation arcade game designed for a quick play in the corner of a pub or fish and chip shop. Why don't fish and chip shops have arcade machines these days, by the way? Little Blaster Street Fighter while waiting for my satelloy? Lovely. Anyway, now we've got a game, it's obvious that this is several game day design steps past the like of Space Invaders. Shooting enemies drops one of those mushrooms, and if our centipedes encounter them, then they turn and go down the screen early, meaning that gardening, as well as enemy control, become vital skills to the whole process. There's a few extra enemies too, most notably these spiders, who have a neat risk-reward mechanic of being worth more the closer you are to them when you shoot them. It's a proper arcade game is what I'm saying. Thin as all hell, but absolutely with some mastering to be done, and perfect for 5 minute short blasts. So why did Go give it 58%? Well I think at least part of it is that it's a 10 year old arcade game with no enhancements. Before these things were really properly retro, no one was really hankering for that, and Accolade put this out at £25, which was full price for Game Boy games at the time. In that context, when it could be your only game purchase for at least a couple of months, it's stingy at best and it's really suited to a couple of quick goes at a time, rather than obsessive play sessions. That £25 this month in Go Alone could have bought you the entertaining, but short, action game Batman Return of the Joker, fun little platformer Popeye 2, or of course, Tiny Toons. So you can see their point. In 2020 though, you should hunt this down as a quick commute game on your Game Boy or differently legal Game Boy sized emulation device. You're not paying £25. It's not your only game until your birthday. 
but it is something you'll want to keep handy for those moments when you get to the station and the train is 10 minutes late. On the back page today is the small YouTuber with the big captions, Avex Fuddle. Fuddle's main genre is very similar to this channel, in that it's all about playing a game for the first time, or at least after a long time. Fuddle though doesn't subject you to his voice the way I do, but communicates in video captions, sometimes with devastating comic timing. Most recently he somehow discoupled Bubble Bubble for the first time, reacquainted himself with the muscle memory of Street Fighter 2, and introduced me to the rather wonderfully designed Arabian. It's a channel of mostly short videos that is absolutely worth your time and eyeballs, and to a much lesser extent, ears. Do go watch some. But that's all we have time for here. Like all magazines, subscriptions keep us going, and there's two other whole seasons of Yesterzine to check out for you newcomers. We'll see you next week, and until then, we'll obviously be playing nothing but Blockbuster. Later! Later!